Hello, and welcome to Resolve, an afterplay show. This is an after show for a role-playing game that does not have an actual play, where we tell you all the details of our game so you don't have to listen to it. Hi, I'm Sammy, I'll be your host, my pronouns are she, her, and I play Asiri Omoli the Mermaid. Joining me today is my wonderful co-host, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex, I use he, him pronouns, and I play Moogle Bounty Hunter Smog and his Malboro companion Juice, both also use he, him pronouns. We are also joined by Carolyn! Hello, I'm Carolyn, I use she, her, her pronouns, and I play Pony, the miniature horse who thinks she is a unicorn, also she, her, her pronouns. We are also joined today by Daniel! Hi, my name is Daniel, I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Game Master for this campaign. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today. So now that we're all here, Alex, why don't you tell us about the actual play? Previously, in a feat. The master asks the party to find the rest of their missing body parts in exchange for the world core. She claims not to have been conscious before the explosion scattering her organs. The master directs Smog to a wall of crystals and warns him about someone, maybe Alexander, who may come if he casts more magic. The master tells the party they each also hold a world core. The master returns Rig to Smog and expels the party by playing a flute. Geyser takes scales from the fish and returns the strider. She loses the scales in the transfer. She notices that a sand wall she directed earlier now looks like a sculpture of her. Another pilot takes her to Sierra to discuss her finds. Back in the tower, the rest of the party discusses why they might possess cores. Geyser speaks with Sierra and officially names the species she found bad fish, spelled B-A-D-D-F-E-C. The party receives notifications that the portals are back up and meet again in the lab. The party tells Aura about the world of the lost and their recent visit. The party enters the black and gray portal. They find themselves in the world of ages, in the snow and in front of a stone castle. So now that you've heard the actual play, let's do a deep dive into the session. We know what the stomach's for, guys. <laughs> Mystery solved. We did it. It's been like a month in the making, but you guys find out, found out the use for the stomach. That was basically right. It's like we're gonna build a robot. So. <laughs> yeah, we're just missing a couple pieces. The robot is made out of purple play-doh, sure, but. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you guys got to meet the master last session. I've been waiting for so long. What did you guys think? I was really intrigued by how non-humanoid the master was, like how purple and gloopy and all of that. That was pretty far out there. Yeah, I distinctly, for a lot of points in this campaign, I don't want to just recycle humans because these are different universes. So there's going to be a lot of non-humans as well. For the master, I wanted someone who had a particularly strange constitution. Can I just say I'm obsessed? (laughs) Absolutely obsessed, because this particular character archetype is delightful and something I play around in my own work. The, like, omnipotent, semi-omnipotent, omniscient being that just does not give a fuck. (laughs) Love it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the very non-human aspect, because I feel like we were all almost careful not to bring humans to this game. It's true, yeah. It's just a reflection of what we've already brought to the table. <laughs> Let's see, we've got the purple from a Siri. We've got, who, who's gloopy? Uh, juice, I guess? <laughs> yeah, juice is a little gloopy. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder if the other body parts are going to be metallic colored, or why the stomach was specifically silver. We haven't really figured that out yet. Maybe they're going to be like different metallic sheens because like if the stomach is silver maybe the brain is gold and the lungs are copper or something like that platinum pancreas i know pancreas is not an (laughs) organ but like the alliteration is fun to be fair the pancreas is an organ but it's just not one of the (laughs) master's missing organs i want to see the master assimilate one of these organs i'm fascinated by the potential implications of this I just imagine him, like, slooping it into his body, like, absorbing it, like some of that metallic sand and the ball bearings. (laughs) Very gross. 
but I can't look away. This first organ, you guys faithfully handed the stomach to Teddy Valentine in the World of Spirits, World of the Lust, and he brought it back. So you guys did not see the process of reuniting an organ. I would like but to see it. <laughs> you guys probably will at some point. Oh man. Disgusting. See it at least once. It's a thing I know I'm going to hate, but I should have the experience. <laughs> you know, that's fair. And Dan just touched on something. It appears that each organ is to be found in a world of the lost connected to each of the portal worlds. Correct. Each of the worlds in this campaign have a companion version of the world of the lost in it. The sixth, the world fragmented into the different worlds that you guys can go to. I very purposely tried to toy with that almost immediately. I picked Smog's move. I'm going to have to open my playbook here. Apparition, the same one I used to make the sphere. I was like, let's see what leeway I can get here. What if I just try to make one right away? Especially if I'm going to get rigged back. I don't need to work on that anymore. But Dan made the very wise choice of saying it would be an imperfect version. So the master is like, you don't really have to do that. (laughs) I I don't want that lame... (laughs) That lame replica of my organ. I want the real thing. Dan, can you say that as if you were the master? I love oh, man. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't need your, your filthy remake or replication of my organ. Mine will do just fine as it is. Hmm, so I'm guessing he's not on the official organ donor list. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> Screw them, people. It does remind me a lot of, for people who might have checked out Adventure Zone, Magic Brian? Magic Brian? Yes. That's the one who is the elf and not the spider. (laughs) The black spider. Black spider. Very early on in the Adventure Zone. Basically the first big bad they run up against. Oh, yes! Yes. I know who you're talking about now. A little less German, a little more of a compromise with Taco. But... (laughs) Pretty much an Adventure Zone elf voice. We might have definitely leached in through that <laughs> huge fan of Adventure Zone balance. The Master fascinates and confuses me because Assyria immediately calls them out on their bullshit, being like, you know, if you're the master of this realm, if your stuff is lost, why don't you have it because it would be here? <laughs> <laughs> the Master, I don't think, gave you a clear answer <laughs> as to be expected. There is a reasoning for it. I'm 100% sure we're going to find out, and I'm going to hate the answer to that. (laughs) (laughs) Mention of the Master gave Smog a pretty strong reaction. How are they feeling now that we've actually met them? I think it's solidified into, this is basically the same link that Smog has with Terra. All right, this is somebody who has a job for me and has some sort of sordid history that I don't need to dig too far into. So it's still a dark link, but even though they're very different people from an outside view, Smog will probably treat them about the same. What about Pony? How do they feel? She's a little mixed on the master. So at the end of the session, when we were doing our link roles, Pony didn't trust the master fully just because she wasn't really sure, okay, is he doing magic or is he doing something else? She just did not vibe with his gloopiness. (laughs) But I failed that roll, and I didn't want to spend another link to roll again. So Dan <laughs> turned my fail roll into a mastery. So now she's kind of thinking, okay, I might not have gotten off on the right hoof with this person, but maybe they do have a lot to teach me. That also unlocked Pony's mastery link with Smog. Oh, that's true. She no longer sees him as the only master she needs, because I know Smog just taught her, what was it? Psycho magic, psycho ball magic. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we didn't do a good enough job recapping what happened in the last session. Tara came in and talked to Smog and Pony a little bit about psycho glass stuff. And while he was making his new rig, basically had Pony do a bunch of psychoglass manipulation to help him work on that. So theoretically, because Smog was like doing some more like design work, Pony mm-hmm. should have more experience with psychoglass than Smog now. Okay. So she was doing work for him, but now she has more experience. The student is becoming the master. Mm-hmm. The master of what is yet to be seen. The master is special floaty metal. 
unlocking that link is going to be interesting going down the road because now that pony doesn't see smog as the end-all be-all person who can teach her all she needs to know and maybe she'll dip her hoof into learning at other master's pawns what does pony hope to learn from the master overall So she doesn't really have a plan. She has an end goal, which is get Horn back. And she's so focused on that, she hasn't actually thought the steps through what she needs to do. She's more like, I'm going to work hard and it's going to happen for me. But then she doesn't spell out the steps. Okay, to work hard, I need to do X, Y, and Z. So she's kind of a whatever happens, happens kind of gal. I didn't want to like back myself into a corner too much and say, no, Pony would only ever do this thing. Because the best part of doing tabletops with so many people is having so many different interactions. Oh my god, what's Geyser gonna do next? Like what weird thing is Pony gonna have to play off of now? (laughs) What a loaded question. What is Geyser going to do next? (laughs) (laughs) That works really well for the knucklehead too, is a playbook, (laughs) because that's an archetype that is usually a student. I think in most of the examples they give. So you have this ability to take different things from all the other characters, but also kind of end up being the best of them at some point by putting everything together. Exactly. It's that shonen manga protagonist. (laughs) I do love some shonen. I really loved in that scene when Pony just took a moment and looked over to Valentine and gave little heads ups like, all right, yeah, Pony knows what level she's at. She's trying to make sure that the other people that are there are still good too. Yeah, Pony doesn't want to make enemies. She will if she has to, but Valentine was pretty cool. This was a very small part of that bigger scene in the world of the Lost, but I wanted to get what your guys' thoughts were about finding out that the old lady that Asiri saw before had finally gotten a name there in the world of the Lost. Smog's initial reaction was basically to be his smart-ass self, be like, well, that means somebody just forgot who she was, right? Then the Master's like, oh, you figured it out. (laughs) That was fast. Maybe this is like too grimdark or whatever, but is this like an impression of her having dementia and just forgetting who she was? It's definitely along the lines of what I was kind of hinting at, Mm -hmm. is that the world of the Lost is a place where anything that disappears or gets misplaced Mm -hmm. finds its way to, as you can see, especially with things like information, that tends to work its way there a lot more easily. I was thinking of it as sort of a reverse Coco, where everybody is there if you still remember them, even if they're dead. But the second that you're completely forgotten, you're gone. Whatever you're trying to access has to be completely forgotten to end up in the world of the loss, is what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good way of looking at it, too. So, uh, about those crystals Smog's been using, then? <laughs> um... <laughs> I might have some explanation, because I, I assume Dan doesn't want to get too much into it, but... The hint that I've given Dan for any Final Fantasy stuff to put in is there's a lot of lore in Final Fantasy XIV that's very accessible that will land with a lot of people, and especially me and Zach. And the the shtick for the summons in Final Fantasy XIV is that there has to be a huge amount of ether around to coax them out of the ether, but they're also not really the gods the game is very clear about that. Maybe not too early on, but by the time you're done with at least the base game, it's pretty clear. So it's not much of a spoiler. What I imagine is happening is that Swang is using up the crystals in Rig. They're going to the World of the Lost, but that is creating a critical mass of Aether that could swim forth at Esper. <laughs> crystals in Final Fantasy always have to have huge magic power, so if you're just stacking a ton of them together, it's going to create a lot of ether that needs to be dealt with. It's like your cigarette butts are summoning God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as as the master said, it now seems like there is a type of weight that is just on the other side of whatever this sort of plane of existence is, and it is quite heavy. (laughs) I love that the, the, it's just a giant wall of crystals. I love that you said it had a scent, but I also didn't ask what it was because I just assumed it was probably just sweet because that's the average of the crystal scents. (laughs) I thought I mentioned it, but they're quite literally, they resemble the crystals that Smog has used up for however many times he's 
used rig. Well, at least I thought I described it as is it's having scents that are coming from all over the place. It's like all of them together sort of conglomerating into this giant mass that's sort of cracking. <laughs> Ugh, I can't imagine it smells very good. Probably smells a little sickening, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> Or sickening. Or no. S- <laughs> <laughs> That's not the master would say. <laughs> oh no. Asiri does not like the master. The master, like, straight up out of the gate is lying. <laughs> so. I just wanted a real jerk who would just be lying through their teeth. All oh, 800 potential teeth. Who knows? It's, it's so fun to just have them. Outface, boldface, lion to Siri is just picking up on every single one. Well, also doing it in such a way that there's a mixed intention and telling a little bit of truth and lie mm-hmm. is really effective for fucking with smog because summoning isn't a good thing for him. The intention to pull something else there is bad, but he had to eventually land on. I am creating the means for Alexander to come. Should he like not? I am casting the spell which will draw him forth. <laughs> my gears were spinning and I was like Smog is just like flying around for a good like half hour of the game <laughs> yeah when you guys got back to uh, Smog's cool pad in the central tower Smog's was like hmm I might just be firing off a lot of magic <laughs> but it is <laughs> inadvertently summoning Alexander not as bad as just summoning them in his mind if there's an excess of mana and an Esper chooses to call themselves forth, that is different than casting the spell to bring them forth. That and Smog got the impression that there was intention behind what was going on when they deep dived with the sort of weird crystal wall that was forming. So I think that kind of reaffirms Smog's intentions like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Alexander has a plan for me. <laughs> <laughs> Part of Jesus's play. <laughs> oh no! A series gonna play along for now for the sake of the party, but she is one hundred twenty thousand percent expecting this creature to double cross them at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Sammy is curious what would happen if a series eats one of these organs. So I'm playing with that. <laughs> what if we have to fight Teddy? That's fine. A series no! already wants to fight Teddy. <laughs> Pony just confirmed that she was cool with Teddy. Doesn't Teddy think that Pony is a hero after you made their, your link with them? I think so. That sounds correct. Yes. When we locked links last time, I didn't roll high enough, but I think it was Zach's bonus that made my move activate. Okay. My special abilities. That also finally happened for Smog recently. Mm-hmm. Now knows that Pony is a hero. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great, yeah. Which we decided, I think, last time we talked about it, might be a little dubious, like, uh, what does a villain want to do to a hero? Oh, no! It would definitely add to tension on this, like, master-protege sort of relationship. (laughs) I also like when we got back to the spire and and into Smog's swanky bachelor pad, we're all having a deep conversation about, like, the core of the worlds and what, like, our spirituality is, and Tao is just like, do you all get messages from higher power? (laughs) (laughs) Are they always so cryptic? (laughs) Yeah, the understanding that Smog was coming to in that conversation was like, maybe we all have the cores because there's some sort of divine blessing that we all have. And was stumped by Pony for a second. The Pony was like, well, unicorns are supposed to be really powerful where I come from. and There's dragons and stuff. It's like, okay, that, that might make sense. Yeah, Pony's a bit of an atheist, mostly just because <laughs> gods don't really exist in her world. The mythical creature should be close enough. Oh, goodness. But also, like, Tao being, like, very confused by Smog being like, you're the Esper, you're the holy thing here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For Smog, it was more about, because I don't know if he's still bought into, you are exactly an Esper at this point, mm-hmm. but Tao was like, do you all have confusing, powerful beings speaking to you all the time. And Smog just tilted his head, looked at Tao, and it's like, you're like that. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> you are the confusing, powerful being. Yeah. And finally got Tao to understand that they are not just code, like there was something else there, and Tao was open about it, and it's like, I don't really understand 
what that part of myself is, which it made Smog a little bit happier. It's like, okay, we're getting somewhere with this. <laughs> I'm still thinking about my failed deep dive with the master about like what they're talking about with the core of the world. And me, Sammy, the player is trying to piece this together too. But I love that what Daniel said to me was like, there's something about all of you that's interconnected in this and you can't quite figure it out, but it makes you want to go home and it makes you really mad at the master for pointing out the situation. <laughs> the master just like bursts out crying. <laughs> That was so sad. I hate to see a Siri cry. I think most people do because it's about to get real gooey. But it's really slimy. <laughs> it also speaks to the personalities of the party that no one was like, "I need to go comfort a Siri." Everyone was like, "Okay, have fun dealing with that. We're gonna keep going." <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I didn't. I didn't even say, think about that. But it was like, "Hey, are you okay?" Well, to be fair, how are you gonna comfort her? She isn't the water, so like hugs are a little unfeasible for most of the party. <laughs> <laughs> no one even, like, said, hey, there's no need to cry, we're all here, we're going to figure it out together. It was like, keep on working. <laughs> <laughs> work, work. <laughs> work, 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 focus. Who in this group is not a workaholic? Like, maybe Geyser? <sighs> Does Pony like to do work? I don't think so. So... I don't know. I wouldn't describe Pony as a workaholic, but she will do whatever it takes to get something she wants. So I guess, like, good enough for these purposes. It's like a high level to entry, but once she's focused on it, she'll finish it. Yeah. So it helps that it's not, like, beast of burden work. She's not, like, mm. transporting anyone anywhere, and she's not, like, hauling carts or anything. Town a series of workaholics. I don't know if a series of workaholic. She works hard. She likes her leisure time as well. Why do you say she's a workaholic? <laughs> From their backstory, they're trying very hard to do the right thing, right? I mean... And learn how to be a priestess. Correct, but trying very hard does not necessarily make you a workaholic. I guess so. Athenos enjoys the downtime, but I think it's always focused on, like, what do I bring back to my job? Like, it's, it's a sort of a fake enjoyment of the downtime. I was gonna say, I don't know if Athedos has a job. <laughs> it's like I'm doing godly things. They're dating. They set up the challenges in the tournaments, so. That's fair. Yeah. Does it even feel like work, though, to Athedos? I don't know. I think he's. I think. I think Athedos has a little bit of fun. Athedos is beyond too. work, I think. Yeah, he's beyond work. <laughs> what did you guys think about the Masters deal with you all as the party? I don't believe them at all. <laughs> Neither was a Siri, for that matter. <laughs> they're going to, like, get all their shit back, literally and metaphorically, and <laughs> they're going to do something to us. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't want to know what, but they're going to purple goo us, and then we're going to become lost forever. <laughs> yeah, what I'm most interested in about being true or not true at this point is the claim to have not had consciousness before. Because if there's no more control after they have all of the body parts, then, like, what's she gonna do? Like, you're just gonna be a representation of the power of the world at that point, so do you have any intention left? It seems like if that part is true, then you might just become the world core, and you don't have any way of denying that to us. True. But this guy's too schmarmy. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe they just became conscious or sentient or whatever. It doesn't ring true. <laughs> He's too conniving. <laughs> I guess also, like, how stuck would we be there if the Master is together again. Like, does that just solidify the world of the loss and close it off from everything else again, even though the thing that is supposed to connect us might become manifest? A very interesting question. Maybe. But then, like, <laughs> if we connect it, then we can go back, but then they can't close it off, so, like... I mean, at that point, Smog might also not have a dark portal because that was one of the starting moves from the dark. Womp womp. So, womp. world travel will be slightly less possible unless somebody picks that up again. <laughs> Also that, like, I forget what it is, but it's like open door move from the Prodigy that also lets you go. Yeah, there's no door. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like how <laughs> they threatened us to sleep but not dream as if I have any control over that. <laughs> what my brain axons are firing to do. That's another annoying thing for Smog with the whole proposition of Alexander, because dreaming is how he had communication before. So now it's just... Either I finish up this wall, and Alexander gets to do whatever he'd like, or nothing. If you do break Alexander through, what do you want them to do? I don't know. 
what Smog thinks is going to happen there. Maybe Alexander could just completely roll back time and have it so that nobody has to get lost from their home worlds. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Alexander can help him fix his mistake with Charlene and the rest of the party from his home world, and he never double crossed them if it seems like things are going right in his world now. There's so much you can do with time travel. That's true. The master has been showing us each little hints of ourself. Like we got Tao has the bow that just says. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Congratulations for giving up on your dreams. That was not what it said, but that's that's what Zach had remembered. And then what the master said. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was thought that it said that, but um, I was like, it's not what it originally said. It was sorry that you have lost dreams but then the ma no. then, but, the, but that's such a funny thing that was said at the tables i was like okay but the master's like yeah congratulations for like, abandoning your dreams or whatever <laughs> and it was like oh, yeah, i had tenure nothing to you before <laughs> i'm responsible for that <laughs> so good so tao has the bow Asiri got the, the shell that they promptly abandoned because they don't take things with them you got the necklace smog yeah i have charlene spend it I was considering, before I got rig back, putting it in the design of the new rig. Aww. Ooh. <laughs> That's cute. You can put it in the old rig. <laughs> It'll be a little bit harder to modify to uh, create something. Hello, crazy glue. <laughs> <laughs> glue it to it. Magitech is a little less malleable than Psycho Glass. <laughs> Hot glue gun, baby, let's go. But has Pony received an item yet? Or no? I don't think so. No. no. Okay. Well, there's still plenty of time. True. Geyser's not received an item either. Yeah. Did a Thanos? He got his hair back. Yeah, that's true. What did you guys think about that? <laughs> Here you go. Have a Gak cover arrow. <laughs> I wanted to play around with the idea that a Thanos just launching an arrow into the jungle in that other world of the lust lost the arrow, and so it returned to the master. So in which case, it just kind of stuck inside of them. It's interesting because I had a split second where I was like, did it just go into their body? But then they couldn't have it just about anything there. So in a sense, yes. Yeah. Guys are, all while this was going on, had their own little adventure in their little sea crab and they basically went on their own biological research project unprompted yeah i kind of logged some fish went on an expedition she collected a bunch of creatures and then harassed this large fish and tried to curl like their scales ice magic to them to sleep and then pluck some scales but unfortunately during the trip home they got flushed out of the storage tank because the Strider has these little claw things. All the storage was full, so guys were just kind of holding it with the Strider, holding the scales. And then when they're back on the dock, it's like they did a deep dive, and they missed. They had to realize something that they wish was not true, and that's that the scales didn't make it out of the water. They're probably not too far away, though, but you do have to go back underneath the ocean to get them. <laughs> I wonder if D had a goal in mind for those scales, what they wanted to use them for? I have an idea. I think that Geyser literally wanted to give them to what would end up being Sierra. I'm pretty sure, because she must have felt that this was something that was notable, that could be useful for doing their science, or as Geyser would put it, their science or whatever. <laughs> I think that was supposed to be a type of prize. I thoroughly enjoyed the interaction between Geyser and Sierra. Sierra, this tough, gritty, tired old man pirate scientist dude <laughs> and this insane clown who is accumulating a posse <laughs> but sierra takes them seriously which is very refreshing i have like the combination of conversations between npcs i definitely was not anticipating that one as much and i wasn't anticipating guys are thoroughly enjoying doing at least what they perceive as scientific things at least you know like the the bread work of it the collecting of stuff. They had a legitimate heart-to-heart -heart talking about their discoveries and also having me talk more about the nature of the biosphere on this planet. I have several questions. I can try to answer them as best I can, but uh, I'm also no biologist. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's for the breadth of this show, unfortunately. <laughs> I have to wonder, and I might have to ask Dee this, but is Geyser so curious about the physical world because they are from 
an imaginary one if they're trying to understand that disconnect between the real and the imagined. She did make some analogies talking about what she was used to on, well, I guess what's now called Conglom. So I think there might be something where guys are starting to try to relate to these things. But it's also like, I don't know if guys is really doing it for anyone besides themselves. There's also an element where even though this is something that she seemed earnestly interested in, she still has to be flippant. Like, yeah. she had to tell the other researchers, I actually don't care what you're working on, you should go find the scales, but it's not my point to say it. And then randomly rolling dice to figure out what the name of the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the species would be, and being spelled like that and then pronounced bad fish, definitely a pretty standard geyser move. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was funny. Rolling a few dice and then attributing each one to a letter and then rearranging them until it felt like a word. <laughs> well, I guess in Geyser's perspective, it was a bad fish. It kept swimming away from her. We also got to see a little bit more of Hound showing pictures of different things so they could identify which was the fish that Geyser found so she could name it. Wherever Hound is, unless they're specifically doing something, I imagine they're not ever too far away from Sierra because they're sort of like Sierra's pet robot. <laughs> in a way. I'm a pet robot. That sounds sweet as hell. <laughs> I love the idea of Hound, this sort of robo dog that can, well, now is used for providing medical assistance, but can do a whole number of things like projecting images on walls and pulling up databases and stuff like that. Sierra must also be a millennial, just, you know, vibing with that robo dog that he could not get in Chuck E. Cheese. Oh my god. <laughs> Did that mug a memory for you? God. <laughs> I felt like more wrinkles growing on my face <laughs> after you said that. We should cut this, but every time I've been to Chuck E. Cheese, somebody cries. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> it's because I didn't get the robo dog. That's, Yeah. <laughs> Are you the cause of this, or does it just happen? <laughs> yes and no. Okay. <laughs> it depends on the circumstance. But I've only been twice, so my sample size is not very large. Alright. Monster of the ball pit. <laughs> As usual. Don't you know it. <laughs> That's a fun idea, too. The monster of the ball pit? Is that the master? <laughs> Yes! <laughs> you know what? I need to write something down. <laughs> oh, the tumbler ball pit. Dash but the master gets the tumbler ball pit. <laughs> what was that called? Dashcon? Dashcon. Yeah. Right. He's going to be playing that next time you guys go there. <laughs> I know you've described the master, but in my head, it's just gloppy from Candyland, but purple. The other detail is like their face. Which I wanted to kind of give the mental image of like a cubist painting, maybe like a Picasso work that like there's a whole bunch of things that are not right, just right next to each other that sort of resembles a face. But you can clearly tell that this is not a human face. <laughs> oh, we did not need that much explanation for that. This is not a human <laughs> I think that's really obvious. She's the most powerful and artistically aware ditto of all time. <laughs> You're right, and you should say it. It's mega ditto. <laughs> mega ditto! She'll also, like, rearrange themselves into different shapes, usually to suit the mood, but also if there's just a time that it feels right, it could be like a donut or a quizzer. How did the donut shape suit the mood? <laughs> <laughs> they felt like being a donut. <laughs> I made a little joke about it in session. Being like, oh, I heard that donut shape's actually pretty bad. Like, was that explicitly supposed to be an everything bagel, everything everywhere all at once reference? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> because that's <laughs> <history. laughs> <It's> demon souls. <laughs> God, I hope I don't accidentally put demon soul stuff for the remainder of this campaign, or else Zach's going to play me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to disclose if it's Demon Souls or not. I promise it's not. <laughs> Did we sign a contract for that? <laughs> so far we have not Demon Souls, yes, everything, everywhere, all at once, not over the garden wall. Not over the garden wall. Shame. I want a little bit. A little, little bit over the garden wall. I think it's been kind of great so far that it's like the places that you guys have gone to have suited the season very well so far. 
we started at the end of summer and you guys were in the canyon for the hub world and then you guys as we went into the fall went into the world of spirit which had a lot of spooky things going on it's very wooded and then now you guys are going to the world of ages which is i'm gonna say the coldest place that you're probably gonna go to <laughs> oh i'm excited the world of ages is snowy and there's a dark gloomy castle and it's very dark outside so siri can open her eyes all the way lovely it's been a while you just made me think of the idea that this entire time a series been squinting she hard has. at like everything. <laughs> she has. <laughs> Part of me hopes this is just the most stereotypical role-playing game fantasy world because all we have so far is snow in a castle. <laughs> <laughs> just like, let's put this weird cavalcade of characters through that. Something that they are not entirely meant for. We just got introduced to it at the end. It's kind of the cliffhanger of the session, I suppose. You guys, we'll see what it's like. I'm looking forward to this one. Is there like a moat or is it just a castle? Like, do we have to cross a bridge or something to get in there? There appear to be no obstacles in your way, but it's very hard to see right now because of how dark it is out there. There's only a few lights coming from within the towers that are in front of you. The actual sort of nature of what it's like is still a bit mysterious. Although I bet a Siri can see pretty well in the dark. A Siri sees great. She can open her <laughs> eyes now. <laughs> yeah. We're all playing races that have dark vision. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna need to get Pony a, a little sweater though, a blanket. She's gonna be too cold. It's gonna be very yeah. cold for you all. She can't grow a winter coat in time. <laughs> She's gonna need one of those. They make these blankets for horses. Sometimes they're called rugs. The fashionable horses always wear them. <laughs> people are gonna start thinking it's like oh what's the like heraldry stuff that you put on top of the horses when you're like riding them into like dressage tack i'm thinking medieval because we're like at a castle so people are gonna think you're like some sort of war horse tiny war horse i was about to say are they gonna lead pony into the stables because she's not gonna like that i don't think medieval horse armor was called barding barding yes Ooh. i've seen that in so many fucking video games you think i would remember it Ugh. i I might have seen it at some point, but I absolutely, I would not have guessed. I have not played a lot of horse video games. Like, at least not since I was a preteen, in which case I played a lot of Barbie horse adventure, but that's a story for a different day. (laughs) I've played so many CRPGs where you can have a horse or a horse-like mount and you can change their barding, so I should have remembered. Alice, you mentioned expecting a lot of fantasy tropes. Do you guys have any, I guess, anticipations for the World of Ages? Well, the name lends obviously that historical tie so it's either gonna be like a high fantasy tolkien-esque sort of (laughs) castle experience that we're anticipating or we're dropped in the dark ages and now we have to deal with like (laughs) these actual people who are actually scared of anything that moves (laughs) there could also be like a doctor who-esque time crisis where we're going to encounter like a robot butler feeding an intelligent dinosaur inside the castle i would love that (laughs) i want an intelligent dinosaur i've not watched doctor who What are you looking forward to, Carolyn? I am looking forward to exploring the relationship of Smog and Pony further, now that Pony and Smog have a little rift between them. Now that Pony's thinking, hey, maybe I don't need to rely on Smog to teach me everything now. Yeah, that'll be interesting. There's a line I've been sitting on for a bit that might come with the playbook change that I think will be very interesting for Pony and Smog's relationship, but I'll be sitting on that one. Yeah, because you are very close to maxing out your playbook. Two more advancements. With this next world, if everyone makes Dark Links with the characters that I have for it, oh right, they could just kind of power level Smog to being close to being there. Yeah, if they're just, like, two characters that everyone hates their guts, <laughs> that could just propel- I hadn't even thought about that. That could just propel Smog right into the next playbook. I was counting on there being a little more time, but we'll see. There's a great deal of opposition, sure, but the party does feel a little bit more comfortable with antagonistic relationships to people. Mm-hmm. It's okay. There's a lot of adversarial situations. Ooh, you know what? I just had an idea about the world of ages. What if it's, like, a monster castle with, like, a Frankenstein, a Dracula? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. There could still be a robot. They could, yeah, there could still be a robot. There we go. <laughs> but be, like, one of those, like, 1950s tin robots. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I want one of those. 
there's one small thing, I guess, from the summary we didn't really go into more detail about, and that was uh, the conversation with Aura. They finally got the portals back working after a lot of trial and tribulation, nonstop hours of trying to redo what they were able to accomplish before. The series like, you should take a break. <laughs> you look exhausted. <laughs> Aura's also like, you could take a break if you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> if I do that, then that purple thing will talk to me again, and I don't want that. <laughs> Aura's going to have a lot of work ahead of them as well to figure out what's going on with the world of the lost. That's anomalous. They weren't expecting that to happen. So far, all the data that we've brought back for the world of the lost has been anomalous, so I don't know why they were shocked by that conclusion. Well, keep in mind that this is the first time after the world of the spirit that you guys actually were able to talk with Aura because. They were frantically running around trying to fix all of the systems after the energy surge from when you connected the first world. You don't need to be so frantic. <laughs> it's also been like, what, somewhere from probably 12 to 16-ish hours since we first showed up. Yeah. They've been running around all day. Smog and Aura, I believe, had a little bit of a moment. They're talking about like how Aura's just trying to make sure that they do the right thing, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to be careful, <laughs> trying to be responsible. <laughs> so they're exerting a lot of caution. Yeah, make sure nothing gets lost anytime soon, because that could be yes. bad for us. Yes. <laughs> and then also in the same breath, like being like, hey, can I take that camera? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. The other camera, I believe, is still in the world of the lost. The yep. master did not deign to bring that back, which is actually something we should also talk about, too. Yeah, they kind of implied that for each body part we get back, they can give us something from the World of the Lost. So Rig was to be that thing this time. One was on the house, except that really wasn't. <laughs> uh -huh. Just a jerk about it. But that's the deal, is that they'll pluck something from the World of the Lost, but they want their organs back. Well, we can't always get what we want. <laughs> I did have to roll a convince somebody for getting the camera, but I think it makes sense that it all worked out because this is one of the few things that Smog is genuinely doing for other people. Like, yeah, it lets him look at whatever Juice is looking at if Juice holds on to it, but it's also probably very valuable research material. Or I definitely did not want to part with it because like, yeah, we requested the supplies that you asked for, but it's literally only been like a couple of hours. We haven't, <laughs> we haven't been able to have them be made available for us. And so I was like, but we really need a video camera. <laughs> so they're just like, fine. <laughs> <Here. Well, laughs> Begrudging, but like you said, it does make sense that you guys being able to do what you're doing is the most important, especially in Aura's opinion. So it does outweigh the necessary function that it was playing before. I guess there, there could be consequences to that. Like, maybe we'll know a little bit less about the energy readings of the portals when we come out next time or something. I have an idea of where the camera was pulled from, so I'm going to play around with a little bit of it. We also got headbands. They look kind of like a headband, but they kind of wrap around, for most people, like humanoids around like the back of the neck, connecting to like the jaws. Holds on, kind of friction fit, and they're nothing too scary or weird. They're very simple communicators. At most, they could like send out just like a signal. You know, you could tell that something has changed with it, but it's not like it's voice to voice communication. So this is something that Pony definitely learned about when we were doing the training before. So exciting that Pony might have something to tell everyone else about how to do. Yeah, Pony is very excited. Most of Pony's life, people were telling her what to do and giving her bits of knowledge. Now she has something to offer up, so she's quite excited. Now, would they fit around both a Thanos' and a Ceres' back of the head? Because they are much larger and not humanoidish in that department. Are they malleable as objects made of psychoglass? I envision that they ran through psychoglass, which means you also got to be able to use psychoglass in order to use them effectively, you know, to communicate with them. Well, Ceres shouldn't have a problem with that because she's in it all the time. If a Siri is able to mentally conceptualize this device well enough, they could hypothetically make it out of the psychoglass that's in her bubble. That would also remove some psychoglass from her bubble, unfortunately. I don't think she wants to do that. That sounds like a very dangerous thing. The more complex the thing is and its function is, the harder it gets to actually form. Well, is there anything that y'all would have done differently? I would have liked to spend a little bit more time with 
either just the old lady or just kind of exploring more about the implications about what the world of the lost is like conceptually it's so weird but it's also kind of heavy in its own way i would like to spend a little bit more time doing that but i also think i'll have more chances to explore that world through other means everything went pretty much how i wanted it to i got to have small kind of little crisis that was fun <laughs> Juice got to catch Rig out of the air. Well, Smog and Rig out of the air when it got tossed back to Smog. That's a fun one for me. I think everything went pretty much fine and dandy for me this time. Is there anything maybe on Smog's list of things to accomplish that we weren't able to get to in the last, the previous session? There is a list of things that I gave Dan that I wanted to get done before the playbook change. And I think we hit both of them, even though I talked about maybe both of them a little bit earlier, I think we hit both of them harder this time into the amount I wanted. As far as stuff Smog wanted to do, I don't think he had the like agency to do too much different this time around. Like there was stuff he needed to know about before he could make any bigger moves. Maybe one little thing Pony could have done was to grill the master a little bit. When the master said the party each had a world core, she could have been like, what? I'm not holding anything. What do you mean by that? Tony is very literal, so <laughs> that would have been some good information for her. Yeah, you did hit on that. We just didn't get to follow up on it. Because I remember you saying, like, I'm not a beast of burden right in the middle of that. <laughs> exactly. She did not get her answer. Next time, though. <laughs> I don't think I would have done anything differently with the Siri, except maybe been a bit more confrontational with the Master, but that's also <laughs> mostly me bleeding through. <laughs> I would be very confrontational with this being. A Siri, maybe not so much. I think the only thing missing is going out into the ocean in Sequence Charter, but there will be more time for that, I'm sure. Alright, let's get into the resolution phase, the segment of the show where we each get to say something about the game with no responses. What is your final say on this session, Daniel? If this podcast was a biology show, I think it'd be called Evolve, an After Grey's podcast. An After Grey's show. About the session, I hope you guys packed your coats. I hope you guys packed your boots. It's gonna be chilly. You can find me in my cool mad scientist tower with my cool robot and my cool Frankenstein and my cool Dracula. <laughs> it sounds very cool. It sounds very cool. It's really cool. <laughs> what about you, Carolyn? What are your final thoughts? I am looking forward for a treasure hunt because Pony is also looking for a body part, if you really think about it. So this kind of aligns with what she wants. And you, Alex? I didn't put a lot of thought into having my character's deity have my name, but I think it's pretty funny every single fucking time I hear it. I did not have anything that I finished recently that I was like super hyped for. So I'm going to have something that ended quite a while ago, actually. I recommend checking out the Behold Her podcast. It is about femmes in tabletop. There's especially a lot of interesting history. A lot of the earlier episodes are about d d if I remember correctly, but it is over. So you can bitch it all in probably a couple of days. But I loved it at the time. So go and check out one of my old favorites. You can find me on Twitter, at Shining Crow Bat, as we've said, if that still exists by the time this episode airs. As for myself, I don't like the Master, but I love the Master, so I'm very conflicted. And I think Asiri hates the Master a lot, and we will have to see where that leads in subsequent interactions with this creature. I'm excited to see where that goes. You can find me at the Gates of Hades. I'm playing Fetch with Cerberus. Come join us. This has been Resolve, an afterplay show. You can find us online at most social media sites at Resolve AP. Except Instagram, which is at Resolve Afterplay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. You can buy the game we're playing, Interstitial, Our Hearts Intertwined, from its creator, Riley Hopkins, at linksmithgames.com. All links will be included in the description of the episode. Thank you again for listening. We end our turn here, so now it's your turn. What's happening in your game?